Counterterrorism incorporates the practice, tactics, techniques, and strategies that governments, militaries, police departments and corporations adopt to attack terrorist threats and or acts, both real and imputed. The tactic of terrorism is available to insurgents and governments. Not all insurgents use terror as a tactic, and some choose not to use it because other tactics work better for them in a particular context. Individuals, such as Timothy McVeigh, may also engage in terrorist acts such as the Oklahoma City bombing. If the terrorism is part of a broader insurgency, counterterrorism may also form a part of a counterinsurgency doctrine, but political, economic, and other measures may focus more on the insurgency than the specific acts of terror. Foreign internal defense is a term used by the United States military for programs supporting other nations in their attempts either to suppress insurgency, lawlessness or subversion or reduce the conditions under which these threats to security could develop. Counterterrorism includes both the detection of potential acts and the response to related events. History in response to the escalating terror campaign in Britain carried out by the militant Irish Fenians in the 1880s, the first counter-terrorism unit ever was established by the Home Secretary, Sir William Harcourt. The Special Irish Branch was initially formed as a section of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Metropolitan Police in 1883, to combat Irish Republican terrorism through infiltration and subversion. Harcourt envisioned a permanent unit dedicated to the prevention of politically motivated violence through the use of modern techniques such as undercover infiltration. This pioneering branch was the first to be trained in counter-terrorism techniques. Its name was changed to Special Branch as it had its remit gradually expanded to incorporate a general role in counter-terrorism, combating foreign subversion and infiltrating organized crime. Law enforcement agencies in Britain and elsewhere, established similar units. Counter-terrorism forces were expanded with the growing threat of terrorism in the late 20th century. Planning Most counter-terrorism strategies involve an increase in standard police and domestic intelligence. The central activities are traditional, interception of communications, and the tracing of persons. New technology has, however, expanded the range of military and law enforcement operations. Domestic intelligence is often directed at specific groups, defined on the basis of origin or religion, which is a source of political controversy. Mass surveillance of an entire population raises objections on civil liberties grounds. Homegrown terrorists, especially lone wolves are often harder to detect because of their citizenship or legal alien status and ability to stay under the radar. To select the effective action when terrorism appears to be more of an isolated event, the appropriate government organizations need to understand the source, motivation, methods of preparation, and tactics of terrorist groups. Good intelligence is at the heart of such preparation, as well as political and social understanding of any grievances that might be solved. Ideally, one gets information from inside the group, a very difficult challenge for HUMINT because operational terrorist cells are often small, with all members known to one another, perhaps even related. Counterintelligence is a great challenge with the security of cell-based systems, since the ideal, but nearly impossible, goal is to obtain a clandestine source within the cell. Financial tracking can play a role, as can communications intercept but both of these approaches need to be balanced against legitimate expectations of privacy. Legal Contexts In response to the growing legislation United Kingdom The United Kingdom has had anti-terrorism legislation in place for more than 30 years. The Prevention of Violence Act 1939 was brought in response to an Irish Republican Army campaign of violence under the S Plan. This act had been allowed to expire in 1953 and was repealed in 1973 to be replaced by the Prevention of Terrorism Act's a response to the Troubles in Northern Ireland. From 1974 to 1989 the temporary provisions of the act were renewed annually. In 2000 the acts were replaced with the more permanent Terrorism Act 2000, which contained many of their powers, and then the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2005. The Anti-Terrorism, 
Crime and Security Act 2001 was formally introduced in the Parliament November 19, 2001 two months after the September 11, 2001 attacks in America. It received royal assent and went into force on December 13, 2001. On December 16, 2004 the Law Lords ruled that Part 4 was incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, but under the terms of the Human Rights Act 1998 it remained in force. The Prevention of Terrorism Act 2005 was drafted to answer the Law Lords ruling and the Terrorism Act 2006 creates new offences related to terrorism, and amends existing ones. The Act was drafted in the aftermath of the 7 July 2005 London bombings, and like its predecessors some of its terms have proven to be highly controversial. United States U.S. legal issues surrounding this issue include rulings on the domestic employment of deadly force by law enforcement organizations. Search and seizure is governed by the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. The U.S. passed the USA Patriot Act after the 9-11 attacks, as well as a range of other legislation and executive orders. The Department of Homeland Security was established to consolidate domestic security agencies to coordinate anti-terrorism as well as national response to major natural disasters and accidents. The Posse Comitatus Act limits domestic employment of the United States Army, requiring presidential approval prior to deploying the Army. Pentagon policy also applies this limitation to the United States Marine Corps, United States Navy, and United States Air Force. The Department of Defense can be employed domestically on presidential order, as was done during the Los Angeles riots of 1992, Hurricane Katrina and the Beltway sniper incidents. External or international use of lethal force would require a presidential finding. Australia Australia has passed several anti-terrorism acts. In 2004, a bill comprising three acts Anti-Terrorism Act, 2004, and was passed. Then Attorney General, Philip Ruddock, introduced the Anti-Terrorism Bill, 2004 on March 31. He described it as a bill to strengthen Australia's counter-terrorism laws in a number of respects a euro a task made more urgent following the recent tragic terrorist bombings in Spain. He said that Australia's counter-terrorism laws require review and, where necessary, updating if we are to have a legal framework capable of safeguarding all Australians from the scourge of terrorism. The Australian Anti-Terrorism Act 2005 supplemented the powers of the earlier acts. The Australian legislation allows police to detain suspects for up to two weeks without charge and to electronically track suspects for up to a year. The Australian Anti-Terrorism Act of 2005 included a shoot-to-kill clause. In a country with entrenched liberal democratic traditions, the measures are controversial and have been criticized by civil libertarians and Islamic groups. Israel Israel monitors a list of designated terrorist organizations and has laws forbidding membership in such organizations, funding or helping them in any way. On December 14, 2006 the Israeli Supreme Court ruled targeted killings were a permitted form of self-defense. Human Rights one of the primary difficulties of implementing effective counter-terrorist measures is the waning of civil liberties and individual privacy that such measures often entail, both for citizens of, and for those detained by states attempting to combat terror. At times, measures designed to tighten security have been seen as abuses of power or even violations of human rights. Examples of these problems can include prolonged, incommunicado detention without judicial review risk of subjecting to torture during the transfer, return and extradition of people between or within countries, and the adoption of security measures that restrain the rights or freedoms of citizens and breach principles of non-discrimination. Examples include, in November 2003 Malaysia passed new counter-terrorism laws that were widely criticized by local human rights groups for being vague and overbroad. Critics claim that the laws put the basic rights of free expression, association, and assembly at risk. Malaysia persisted in holding around 100 alleged militants without trial, including five Malaysian students detained for alleged terrorist activity while studying in Karachi, Pakistan. In November 2003 a Canadian Syrian national, Meharera, 
alleged publicly that he had been tortured in a Syrian prison after being handed over to the Syrian authorities by U.S. In December 2003 Colombia's Congress approved legislation that would give the military the power to arrest, tap telephones and carry out searches without warrants or any previous judicial order. Images of unpopular treatment of detainees in U.S. custody in Iraq and other locations have encouraged international scrutiny of U.S. operations in the war on terror. Hundreds of foreign nationals remain in prolonged indefinite detention without charge or trial in Guantanamo Bay, despite international and U.S. constitutional standards some groups believe outlaw such practices. Hundreds of people suspected of connections with the Taliban or al-Qaeda remain in long-term detention in Pakistan or in U.S.-controlled centers in Afghanistan. China has used the war on terror to justify its policies in the predominantly Muslim Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region to stifle Uyghur identity. In Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, Yemen and other countries, Scores of people have been arrested and arbitrarily detained in connection with suspected terrorist acts or links to opposition armed groups. Until 2005 11 men remained in high security detention in the UK under the Anti-Terrorism, Crime and Security Act 2001. Many would argue that such violations exacerbate rather than counter the terrorist threat. Human rights advocates argue for the crucial role of human rights protection as an intrinsic part to fight against terrorism. This suggests, as proponents of human security have long argued, that respecting human rights may indeed help us to incur security. Amnesty International included a section on confronting terrorism in the recommendations in the Madrid Agenda arising from the Madrid Summit on Democracy and Terrorism. Democratic principles and values are essential tools in the fight against terrorism. Any successful strategy for dealing with terrorism requires terrorists to be isolated. Consequently, the preference must be to treat terrorism as criminal acts to be handled through existing systems of law enforcement and with full respect for human rights and the rule of law. We recommend taking effective measures to make impunity impossible either for acts of terrorism or for the abuse of human rights in counter-terrorism measures. The incorporation of human rights laws in all anti-terrorism programs and policies of national governments as well as international bodies. While international efforts to combat terrorism have focused on the need to enhance cooperation between states, Proponents of human rights have suggested that more effort needs to be given to the effective inclusion of human rights protection as a crucial element in that cooperation. They argue that international human rights obligations do not stop at borders and a failure to respect human rights in one state may undermine its effectiveness in the international effort to cooperate to combat terrorism. Preemptive neutralization Some countries see preemptive attacks as a legitimate strategy. This includes capturing killing, or disabling suspected terrorists before they can mount an attack. Israel, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Russia have taken this approach, while Western European states generally do not. Another major method of preemptive neutralization is interrogation of known or suspected terrorists to obtain information about specific plots, targets, the identity of other terrorists, whether or not the interrogation subjects himself is guilty of terrorist involvement. Sometimes more extreme methods are used to increase suggestibility, such as sleep deprivation or drugs. Such methods may lead captives to offer false information in an attempt to stop the treatment, or due to the confusion brought on by it. These methods are not tolerated by European powers. In 1978 the European Court of Human Rights ruled in the Ireland v. United Kingdom case that such methods amounted to a practice of inhuman and degrading treatment, and that such practices were in breach of the European Convention on Human Rights Article 3. Non-military, the human security paradigm outlines a non-military approach which aims to address the enduring underlying inequalities which fuel terrorist activity. Causal factors need to be delineated and measures implemented which allow equal access to resources and sustainability for all people. Such activities empower citizens providing freedom from fear and freedom from want. This can take many forms including the provision of clean drinking water, education, vaccination programs, provision of food and shelter and protection from violence, military or otherwise. 
successful human security campaigns have been characterized by the participation of a diverse group of actors including governments, NGOs, and citizens. Foreign internal defense programs provide outside expert assistance to a threatened government. FID can involve both non-military and military aspects of counter-terrorism. Another preventative action that has been used is the threat of and use of pork and pork products against radical religious groups that feel that contact with pork will render them unclean. The bodies of killed terrorists are daubed with lard and buried wrapped in pigskin. Military Terrorism has often been used to justify military intervention in countries like Pakistan where terrorists are said to be based. That was the main stated justification for the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. It was also a stated justification for the second Russian invasion of Chechnya. Military intervention has not always been successful in stopping or preventing future terrorism, like during the Malayan emergency, the Mau Mau uprising, and most of the campaigns against the IRA during the Irish Civil War, the Yes Plan, the Border Campaign and the Troubles in Northern Ireland. Although military action can disrupt a terrorist group's operations temporarily, it sometimes doesn't end the threat completely. Thus repression by the military in itself usually leads to short-term victories, but tend to be unsuccessful in the long run. However, new methods such as those taken in Iraq have yet to be seen as beneficial or ineffectual. Preparation, police, fire, and emergency medical response organizations have obvious roles. Local firefighters and emergency medical personnel have plans for mitigating the effects of terrorist attacks, although police may deal with threats of such attacks. Target hardening, whatever the target of terrorists, there are multiple ways of hardening the targets to prevent the terrorists from hitting their mark, or reducing the damage of attacks. One method is to place jersey barrier or other sturdy obstacles outside tall or politically sensitive buildings to prevent car and truck bombing. Aircraft cockpits are kept locked during flights, and have reinforced doors, which only the pilots in the cabin are capable of opening. UK railway stations removed their rubbish bins in response to the provisional IRA threat, as convenient locations for depositing bombs. Scottish stations removed theirs after the 7th of July bombing of London as a precautionary measure. The Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority purchased bomb-resistant barriers after the September 11 terrorist attacks. A more sophisticated target hardening approach must consider industrial and other critical industrial infrastructure that could be attacked. Terrorists need not import chemical weapons if they can cause a major industrial accident such as the Bhopal disaster or the Halifax explosion. Industrial chemicals in manufacturing, shipping, and storage need greater protection, and some efforts are in progress. To put this risk into perspective, the first major lethal chemical attack in WWI used 160 tons of chlorine. Industrial shipments of chlorine, widely used in water purification and the chemical industry, travel in 90 or 55 ton tank cars. To give one more example, the North American electrical grid has already demonstrated, in the Northeast blackout of 2003, its vulnerability to natural disasters coupled with inadequate, possibly insecure, SCADA networks. Part of the vulnerability is due to deregulation leading to much more interconnection in a grid designed for only occasional power selling between utilities. A small number of terrorists, attacking key power facilities when one or more engineers have infiltrated the power control centers, could wreak havoc. Equipping likely targets with containers of pig lard has been utilized to discourage attacks by Islamist suicide bombers. The technique was apparently used on a limited scale by British authorities in the 1940s. The approach stems from the idea that Muslims perpetrating the attack would not want to be soiled by the lard in the moment prior to dying. The idea has been suggested more recently as a deterrent to suicide bombings in Israel. However, the actual effectiveness of this tactic is probably limited as it is possible that a sympathetic Islamic scholar could issue a fatwa proclaiming that a suicide bomber would not be polluted by the swine products. Command and control, in North America and other continents, for a threatened or completed terrorist attack, the incident command system is apt to be invoked to control the various services that may need to be involved in the response. 
ICS has varied levels of escalation, such as might be needed for multiple incidents in a given area, for example, the 2005 bombings in London or the 2004 Madrid train bombings, or all the way to a national response plan invocation if national level resources are needed. National response, for example, might be needed for a nuclear, biological, radiological, or large chemical attack. Damage mitigation, fire departments, perhaps supplemented by public works agencies, utility providers, and heavy construction contractors, are most apt to deal with the physical consequences of an attack. Local security, again under an incident command model, local police can isolate the incident area, reducing confusion, and specialized police units can conduct tactical operations against terrorists, often using specialized counter-terrorist tactical units. Bringing in such units will normally involve civil or military authority beyond the local level. Medical services, emergency medical services will bring the more seriously affected victims to hospitals, which will need to have mass casualty and triage plans in place. Public health agencies, from local to national level, may be designated to deal with identification, and sometimes mitigation, of possible biological attacks, and sometimes chemical or radiologic contamination. Tactical units. Today, many countries have special units designated to handle terrorist threats. Besides various security agencies, there are elite tactical units, also known as special mission units, whose role is to directly engage terrorists and prevent terrorist attacks. Such units perform both in preventive actions, hostage rescue and responding to ongoing attacks. Countries of all sizes can have highly trained counter-terrorist teams. Tactics, techniques and procedures for manhunting are under constant development. Most of these measures deal with terrorist attacks that affect an area, or threaten to do so. It is far harder to deal with assassination, or even reprisals on individuals, due to the short warning time and the quick exfiltration of the assassins. These units are specially trained in tactics and are very well equipped for CQB with emphasis on stealth and performing the mission with minimal casualties. The units include takeover force, snipers, EOD experts, dog handlers and intelligence officers. See Counterintelligence and Counterterrorism Organizations for National Command, Intelligence, and Incident Mitigation. The majority of counterterrorism operations at the tactical level are conducted by state, federal and national law enforcement agencies or intelligence agencies. In some countries, the military may be called in as a last resort. Obviously, for countries whose military are legally permitted to conduct police operations, this is a non-issue, and such counter-terrorism operations are conducted by their military. See Counterintelligence for Command, Intelligence and Warning, and Incident Mitigation Aspects of Counter-Terror. Examples of actions, some counter-terrorist actions of the 20th and 21st century are listed below. See List of Hostage Crises for a more extended list, including hostage-taking that did not end violently. Designing anti-terrorism systems, the scope for anti-terrorism systems is very large in physical terms as well as in other dimensions, such as type and degree of terrorism threat, political and diplomatic ramifications, and legal issues. In this environment, the development of a persistent anti-terrorism protection system is a daunting task. Such a system should bring together diverse state-of-the-art technologies to enable persistent intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance missions, and enable potential actions. Designing such a system of systems comprises a major technological project. A particular design problem for this system is that it will face many uncertainties in the future. The threat of terrorism may increase, decrease or remain the same, the type of terrorism and location are difficult to predict, and there are technological uncertainties. Yet we want to design a terrorism system conceived and designed today in order to prevent acts of terrorism for a decade or more. A potential solution is to incorporate flexibility into system design for the reason that the flexibility embedded can be exercised in future as uncertainty unfolds and updated information arrives. And the design and valuation of a protection system should not be based on a single scenario, but an array of scenarios. 
flexibility can be incorporated in the design of the terrorism system in the form of options that can be exercised in the future when new information is available. Using these a Euro real options a Euro unregistered trademark will create a flexible anti-terrorism system that is able to cope with new requirements that may arise. Law enforcement police, while some countries with long-standing terrorism problems, such as Israel, have law enforcement agencies primarily designed to prevent and respond to terror attacks, in other nations, counter-terrorism is a relatively more recent objective of civilian police and law enforcement agencies. While some civil libertarians and criminal justice scholars have called out efforts of law enforcement agencies to combat terrorism as futile and expensive or as threats to civil liberties, other scholars have begun describing and analyzing the most important dimensions of the policing of terrorism as an important dimension of counterterrorism, especially in the post-September 11 era, and have argued how police institutions view terrorism as a matter of crime control. Such analyses bring out the civilian police role in counterterrorism next to the military model of a war on terror. Counterterrorism and American law enforcement. Pursuant to passage of the Homeland Security Act of 2002, federal, state, and local law enforcement administrators began to systemically reorganize. Two primary federal departments and the Department of Homeland Security house most of the federal agencies that are prepared to combat domestic and international terrorist attacks. These include, Border Patrol, the Secret Service, the Coast Guard and the FBI. Following suit from federal changes pursuant to 9-11, however, most state and local law enforcement agencies began to include a commitment to fighting terrorism in their mission statements. Local agencies began to establish more patterned lines of communication with federal agencies. Some scholars have doubted the ability of local police to help in the war on terror and suggest their limited manpower is still best utilized by engaging community and targeting street crimes. While counter-terror measures have been adapted during the last decade, to enhance counter-terror in law enforcement, there have been remarkable limitations to assessing the actual utility effectiveness of law enforcement practices that are ostensibly preventative. Thus, while sweeping changes in counter-terrorism rhetoric redefined most American post-9-11 law enforcement agencies and theory, it is hard to assess how well such hyperbole has translated into practice. In intelligence-led policing ILP, efforts, the most quantitatively amenable starting point for measuring the effectiveness of any policing strategy is usually to assess total financial costs against clearance rates or arrest rates. Since terrorism is such a rare event phenomena, measuring arrests or clearance rates would be a non-generalizable and ineffective way to test enforcement policy effectiveness. Another methodological problem in assessing counterterrorism efforts in law enforcement hinges on finding operational measures for key concepts in the study of homeland security. Both terrorism and homeland security are relatively new concepts for criminologists, and academicians have yet to agree on the matter of how to properly define these ideas in a way that is accessible. Notable international counterterrorism agencies, plus indicates military organization allowed to operate domestically. Albania, RENEA, Argentina, GOF Falcon Commando, Australia, State and Australian Federal Police, Police Tactical Groups, Tactical Assault Group, and Australian Security and Intelligence Organization, Austria, EKO Cobra. Austrian Military Police Plus, Bangladesh, Rapid Action Battalion Plus. Police SWAT. Bangladesh Barak Commandos. Bangladesh Navy Special Warfare Diving and Salvage, Brazil, State Local Police SWAT Teams, BOPE, CO, GATE, COT, Belgium, Directorate of Special Units Federal Police Special Units, Bosnia and Herzegovina, SIPA, Bulgaria, Specialis Ironotriad Zarborba S. Terrorisma, Canada, Emergency Task Force, Joint Task Force 2 Plus, Chile, GOPE ATA. China, Snow Leopard Commando Unit Plus, Beijing SWAT. Colombia, AFEUR Plus, GAULA, COPES, Croatia, Luico Anti Terrorist Unit, RH Alpha, Czech Republic, URNA National Police Rapid Response Unit or Ashtvarikla Copyright Ho Nasazina Denmark, Politiets Action Stick, 
Dominican Republic, Anti-Terrorism Special Commander Euro Commando A Special Contra-Terrorismo, Egypt, Unit 777, Hostage Rescue Force HRF, Estonia, K Commando, Finland, Karu Rima Currency, Uti Jaeger Regiment, Guard Jaeger Regiment, France, Police Units GIPN, Raiden Gendarmerie GIGN Plus, Georgia, MIASOCCTC, SSPS, SOD, Status and Clear, KUD, Disbanded. Army SOF, Germany, Police SEK slash MEK, USK, ZUZ and Bundespols AGSG9 Plus, Greece, Anti Terror Division, Greek Police and Special Anti Terrorist Unit. Hungary, Counter Terrorism Center, Alert Police, Hungarian Homeland Defense Forces, Iceland, Barking Gazvitin, India, Rashtriya Rifles, NSG, MIA, Anti Terrorist Squad, Force One, Thunderbolt, State Local Police SWAT Teams, Indonesia, Detachment 88, Sajun 81 Slash Gulta Plus, Detachment Bravo 90 Plus, Jalamankara Detachment Plus, Iran, NAJA, NOPO, Police Amniot, Iraq, Iraqi Hiller SWAT, Ireland, Garda Special Detective Unit, Garda Emergency Response Unit, Garda National Surveillance Unit, Defense Forces Directorate of Intelligence, Defense Forces Army Ranger Wing, Israel, YAMAM a Euro Elite Israeli Police Anti-Terror Unit, Mistama Revim a Euro IDF and Border Guard Undercover Units for Foiling. Terrorism, Shin Bet, Counter-Terrorism Intelligence and Security Agency, Italy, NOCS, GIS, ATPI, Japan, Special Assault Team, Special Security Team, Central Readiness Force, Kosovo, NJSISIU Special Intervention Unit, Latvia, Omega Police Unit, Lithuania, ARAS Lithuanian Police Force of Anti-Terrorism Operations, Malaysia, Royal Malaysia Police Special Task Force, Royal Malaysia Police Pasukan Jerakan Cars, Ungarin, Rapid Actions Troops, Star APMM, Netherlands, DSI and Police Special Arrest Teams Royal Marachorsi Dutch Marines BBE, New Zealand, Special Tactics Group, NZSAS Tactical Assault Group, Nigeria, National Intelligence Agency, Norway, Emergency Response Unit, FSK Plus, Pakistan, Special Service Group, Pakistan Army Rangers, and Elite. Police Commandos, Philippines, PNP Special Action Force, Philippine Navy Naval Special Warfare Group, Coast Guard Special Operations Group and Police SWAT Teams, Poland, SPAP, Portugal, GOE and COE, Romania, Brigada and Titlerista Florin, Russia, Spetsgruppa, Vimpel, OMON, Spetsnaz GOU, Vitiers, Rus, SOBR, Serbia, SAJ, PTJ, Cobras MP, MPCT Battalion, Slovenia, Special Police Unit, SEP Slovenian National Police Forces, South Korea, 707th Special Mission Unit Plus, Sri Lanka, Special Forces, Special Task Force, Spain, GEO, UEI and GEI, Sweden, National Task Force and Tsar Currency Rules Gilda Operation Skrupin, Taiwan, Thunder Squad, Turkey, Azel Tim Azel Harakatmi, and Maroon Berets, Tunisia, BAT and USGN, United Kingdom, Counterterrorism Command, United States, FBI Hostage Rescue Team, Federal Air Marshal Service, U.S. Air Force Office of Special Investigations Anti-Terrorism Speciality Teams, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, BORTAC, State Local Police SWAT Teams, Uruguay, GEO and Escorpia Cube Den Commando Group, Military. Given the nature of operational counterterrorism tasks national military organizations do not generally have dedicated units whose sole responsibility is the prosecution of these tasks. Instead the counterterrorism function is an element of the role, allowing flexibility in their employment, with operations being undertaken in the domestic or international context. In some cases the legal framework within which they operate prohibits military units conducting operations in the domestic arena. United States Department of Defense Policy, based on the Posse Comitatus Act, 
forbids domestic counterterrorism operations by the U.S. military. Units allocated some operational counterterrorism task are frequently special forces or similar assets. In cases where military organizations do operate in the domestic context some form of formal handover from the law enforcement community is regularly required, to ensure adherence to the legislative framework and limitations. Such as the Iranian embassy siege, the British police formally turned responsibility over to the Special Air Service when the situation went beyond police capabilities. See also, Civilian Casualty Ratio, Counterinsurgency, Counter-IED Efforts, Explosive Detection, Extrajudicial Execution, Extraordinary Rendition, Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism, Informant, Irregular Warfare, Manhunt, Manhunt, Preventive State, Security Increase. Sociology of Terrorism, Special Activities Division, Central Intelligence Agency, Targeted Killing, Terrorism Research Center, War Amongst the People, Notes. Further reading, Ariel Mirari, Terrorism as a Strategy in Insurgency, Terrorism and Political Violence, Volume 5, No. 4, PPA 213 Euro 251. Edwin Bakker, Tinker Veldwiz. A Fear Management Approach to Counterterrorism, Galeano Giuseppe, Agitazione Soversiva, Guerra Psicologica e Terrorismo ISBN 978-88-6178-600-4, Unservis Books. Ishmael Jones, The Human Factor, Inside the CIA's Dysfunctional Intelligence Culture ISBN 978-1-59403-382-1. Encounter Books. Ivan Aragua N. Toft, Tunnel at the End of the Light, A Critique of U.S. Counterterrorist Grand Strategy, Cambridge Review of International Affairs, Volume 15, No. 3, PPA 549 Euro 563. Ivan Aragua N. Toft, How to Lose a War on Terror, A Comparative Analysis of a Counterinsurgency Success and Failure. In January NGSTRA Paragraph M and Isabel Duvestian, Eds, Understanding Victory and Defeat in Contemporary War. James Mitchell, Identifying Potential Terrorist Targets A Study in the Use of Convergence. G2 White Paper on Terrorism, Copyright 2006, G2. Counterterrorism Conference, June 2006, Washington, D.C., James F. Pastor. Terrorism and Public Safety Policing, Implications for the Obama Presidency. Jessica Dorsey, Christoph Paul Lusson, Boundaries of the Battlefield, A Critical Look at the Legal Paradigms and Rules Encountering Terrorism. Kuriansky, Judy, Editor, Terror in the Holy Land, Inside the Anguish of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. Mark Sageman, Understanding Terror Networks, ISBN 0-8122. 3808-7. Lee, Newton, Counterterrorism and Cybersecurity, Total Information Awareness, ISBN 978-1-4614-7204-9. Sinkonen, Timu, Bandana Asthana, Cross-Border Terrorism in India, Counterterrorism Strategies and Challenges, ACDIS Occasional Paper, Program in Arms Control, Disarmament, and International Security, University of Illinois, Zussman, Lynn, Editor, The Law of Counterterrorism. External links, U.S. Bureau of Counterterrorism, National Counterterrorism Security Office.